Hi, and welcome to lesson three of our module on quantum internet. In this lesson, we're going to talk about quantum error corrected repeaters. We will learn how quantum error correction can help us in the quantum communication. So in the first step, we're going to give you a very brief introduction to quantum error correction. In the previous lesson, we talked about how we can manage errors using heralded purification as a means of detecting errors. This was our method. So we distributed a bell pair between two uh, nodes of a quantum network, which we wanted to test if it has been affected by a noise, in this case, um, a Pauli X uh, error. In order to do so, we distributed a second bell pair between the same nodes and used it um, as a means of checking uh, whether an error has occurred. So we measured the second bell pair after uh, applying the C not gates between the first pair and the second pair, and if the parity of the measurements was odd, so one gave us a zero and the other one a one, or the other way around, we discarded both bare pairs. And this is kind of uh, waste, um, wasteful. So we could detect an error, but we had no means of correcting it. And that's the job of error correction. So how does error correction work in classical communication? Let's say that we are trying to communicate a single bit, either a zero or a one. And with some probability p, uh, when it passes, emerges from the channel as the output, uh, it flips uh, its value. So a zero can become a one, or a one can become a zero with probability p. And with probability one minus p, it remains unaffected. So a zero stays a zero, and one stays a one. So if Alice is trying to communicate the following bit string, zero, zero, one, she sends it through the channel, but some of the bits might get flipped. Bob received, let's say, this message, 0, 1, 1. So we see that the second bit has flipped its value from a 0 to a 1. He has no means of detecting whether an error has occurred or no. And this is what we're going to tackle in the next slide. So what Alice can do is she can use multiple physical bits in order to encode a logical bit. So uh, we're going to use, uh, this is known as a repetition code. As our example here, she, rather than sending a physical, um, physical bit one, she sends three bits representing one logical bit. So if she wants to send a zero, she sends three zeros. If she wants to send a one, she sends three ones. These uh, triplets are known as code words. So her uh, initial, her original message was zero, zero, one. Now what she does, she sends the following nine physical bits. She sends a triplet of all zeros, representing the logical zero. She sends another triplet of all zeros, representing uh, her second bit, logical bit. And then the last bit, she sends a triplet of all ones. Again, some of these bits will flip. In this case, we assume that the middle bit uh, over here in the second triplet has flipped, and the last bit in the last triplet has also flipped. But now, Bob is not helpless. What he can do is he can take a majority vote. He looks at the values of the bits inside one triplet and he takes the majority vote in the following way. If all of them are zero, he just decodes it as a logical zero. In the second triplet, he sees that two of them are zero. So he decodes the whole triplet as a logical zero as well. And in the last one, he sees that the majority of the bits are in a state one, so he decodes it as a logical one. In this way, he can recover the original message that Alice was trying to communicate, even though it was affected by errors. Now, when does this code work? So we saw that if there are no errors, then of course the code works automatically. And this happens with probability one minus p to the power of three. The probability one minus p represents the probability that a single qubit does not uh, flip. So it's not affected by the error. We just saw in the previous slide that it also is corrected, uh, that we can correct a single error. A single error occurs with probability three times p times one minus p squared. So here, one bit flips, that's represented by this probability p, and two uh, bits remain unchanged. So that's the one minus p squared. And which bit flips? Um, it can occur in three different ways, either the first one, the middle one, or the last one. So that gives us this factor of three in front. On the other hand, if two bits flip, th then the error correction scheme fails, because when Bob takes the majority vote, he decodes it as the wrong logical uh, bit. 
This happens with the following probability. And similarly, if all physical bits flip, then the error correction also fails. So the total probability of failure is given by this following expression. It's just the sum of the individual probabilities uh, when the code fails. And with a little bit of algebra or a little bit of uh, function plotting, we can see that if the probability that a physical bit flips is less than a half, then this uh, logical error probability PE is suppressed. It's less than the physical error P. In other words, we are suppressing the probability of error in our communication. Now, how does quantum repetition code work? We start with the first step, that's the encoding part. So what we do is we take the um, state 0 and state 1 and we encode it in the following way. 0 goes into 0 state 0, 0, 0 and state 1 goes into state 1, 1, 1. And we're going to call these our logical qubits, 0 and logical qubit 1. In here we have a quantum circuit that achieves this encoding. So these three wires represent three physical qubits. The first one is um, initialized in the state that we are trying to communicate, some arbitrary superposition, alpha 0 plus beta 1, and the other two qubits are in, initialized in the state 0. And just by applying these two C naught gates controlled on the first qubit, we achieve our encoding in the following way. So Psi L is now our uh, encoded logical qubit. So if, for example, the second qubit is affected by an error, and its value flips, then our logical qubit psi l goes to the following state. Now, how do we detect that this error has occurred? Can we just measure the qubits? And the answer is no. What we have to do is we have to do syndrome measurements. This is our second step. If we just measure the qubits directly, what we're going to do is we are going to destroy the superposition. We're going to lose any information about the alpha and the beta. And this is a big no-no. So, how uh, syndrome measurement works is we take our three qubits that are uh, encoding our logical qubit and we use two ancilla qubits. We initialize them in the state zero and now what we're going to do is we're going to compare if the parity of the first of the neighboring qubits is the same. That's uh, what we're doing with these two C0 gates. So we see that if both of the qubits have the same parity, they're either 0, 0 or they are 1, 1, this ancilla qubit uh, is going to remain in the state 0 after the first two C0 gates. If the physical uh, qubits over here used for the encoding are both 0, 0, then no flips occur here and the state of the qubit is 0. If both of them are 1, 1, so they still have even parity, then we apply the C0 gate twice, which uh, returns us back to the 0 state. So when we measure the first ancilla uh, qubit, we're going to get a zero. We do that with the second two um, uh, C naught gates as well. We compare the parity between the first qubit and the third qubit. And from that, we can uh, locate which qubit has undergone an error. If both of the classical uh, bits, a zero and a one, are zero, zero, then we can say that no error has occurred. On the other hand, if a zero is zero, and a1 is 1, then we know that the first two qubits have the same parity, but the first one and the third qubit have a different parity. That means that the third qubit differs from the first two, means it has undergone an error. So we have just located that the qubit number 3 has been bit flipped. Similarly for the other two uh, possibilities, uh, 1, 0 and 1, 1. So, the crucial bit here is that we have detected and localized the error without learning any information about alpha and beta. We have not destroyed our superposition. So knowing where the error has occurred, now it's quite trivial to apply a recovery operation. For the repetition code, it's very simple. All we have to do is apply a Pauli x to the relevant uh, qubit, as shown over here. And we're going to represent this uh, operation, this recovery circuit, um, written out in this form, just as a box R. And this concludes um, our quantum error correction cycle. So putting everything together, what we have is the following. We start with some physical state that we would like to communicate, this Psi. We use two other physical qubits to create an encoded logical qubit in this um, box over here. If it undergoes an error, 
we can check with a syndrome measurement in order to localize where the error has occurred and using the classical bits from the syndrome measurement we can apply a recovery operation. And this in principle will return us to our uh, logical encoded uh, qubit psi L. So this is one cycle of quantum error correction. But there's nothing preventing us from applying this cycle again and again and again, as, as you can see over here. So again, we start with the encoding and maybe error happens. Then we apply the cycle of error correction composed of the syndrome measurement and the recovery. Then maybe another error occurs, so we repeat the cycle again. And in principle, we can keep uh, our encoded qubit intact uh, and correct it in this way. We can go through the same uh, analysis as we did for the classical repetition code and see that the probability of a logical error is given uh, by this expression over here, which is identical to the uh, classical uh, logical probability error. And again, if the error that one single face, uh, one single physical qubit is flipped is less than a half, then we are suppressing the error. There are a few caveats. This repetition code that we have presented here works only for Pauli x errors. For example, it doesn't correct Pauli z errors. And also, we are assuming that all these operations, the C nodes and the measurements that we are applying, are noiseless. So here we're going to conclude with some basic notation about quantum error correcting codes. The distance of a code D is given um, as the shortest distance between two code words. Distance in this sense means the smallest number of operations that we need to apply in order to transform from one code word into a different one. For our example of the three qubit repetition code, in order to go from logical zero to logical one, we have to apply three Pauli x operations. That means that the distance of this code is three. A very related um, quantity to the distance is the number of correctable errors, t. And uh, it's related to the distance in the following way. So for our repetition code, we see that it can only um, correct a single uh, error. Uh, and the usual characterization of a quantum code is in this um, quantum block um, notation where we have double square brackets on each side. This represents that we are talking about a quantum code. And then we have three parameters, n, k, d. n is the number of physical qubits that we are using to encode k logical qubits. And d is the distance of the code. For example, the repetition code that we have used so far is a 313 code and it can correct one uh, error. But there's a whole zoo of quantum error correcting codes. We have seen the repetition code for uh, bit flips, but there's a very similar repetition code for face flips. And we can combine these two codes uh, to create a code which can, um, uh, which can correct arbitrary errors. It, co it corrects both X and Z errors. This is known as the Shor code and it's given by uh, this in this 9, 1, 3 notation. So we need nine physical qubits to encode a single logical qubit, and the distance of the code is three, so it works when a single physical qubit is affected by the error. There's a very large and very important class of uh, quantum error correcting codes known as stabilizer codes. And here are only a few examples. The Steen code uses seven physical qubits in order to um, encode a single logical qubit. And there are something what's known as the CSS codes, Kaldeberg, Shor, or Steen code. There are bacon Shor codes, there are surface codes. All of these codes are extremely important, particularly in quantum, um, quantum uh, computation. What we are going to concentrate in the rest of this lesson is mainly the simple case of a repetition code. This concludes our first step on introduction to quantum error correction.